Eric Dieters, the Bulldog on Real Talk 1160. Good Monday morning to everybody and Bulldog Nation. I am ready to deliver radio superbity. Let me tell you what we have on tap. We have on tap my legal analysis and political analysis of the Supreme Court's decision-making relative to the oral argument they're going to hear over three days. You're going to get a commentary about the Trevin Martin shooting uh, down in Florida way. You're going to get my analysis of our Jack Wagon's president handling the Afghan shooting of Robert Bales. And I am going to tell you a story of my daughter's wedding where I personally witnessed Friday, and I'd say a little before 7, an incredible miracle. Which, if you're a lady out there, I'll guarantee you, you'll be balling by the time I finish the story. And even you hardened men will have goosebumps as I share the story with you. But anyway, my daughter's wedding on Friday was an incredible success. And I want to thank everybody for the good wishes. I do want to apologize for all my good friends who weren't invited, as I pointed out on the radio, that uh, I had Willie was not even invited. And I talked to him every day. Uh, it was the oldest and dearest friends and family. So uh, sometimes you just got to make those choices. Seven days a week is how many t- days that you can now get our newsletter and blog. It's going to come seven days a week. Uh, we started it on Saturday. Therefore, it will never be stale. The news will never be stale. And, ladies and gentlemen, the American Jerry, I did not forget about sports. Are you kidding me? Absolutely not. In fact, I'm going to begin with sports. And uh, the song of the day is for all of you Buckeye fans. And I want to apologize uh, to the Bearcat fans and the Xavier Musketeer fans and the Ohio Bobcat fans. Your run in the NCAA was gallant. I have nothing but praise for you and your coaches and your effort. But... It is true that it is the survival of the fittest. And the four fittest teams are Kansas, my UK Wildcats, which I am displaying a hoodie, but I don't have my hood up, the Louisville Cardinals, and the Ohio State Buckeyes. And this is for the Ohio State Buckeye fans because you are one of the final four. How do you like that, folks? The Feel Good, played by the Ohio State Buckeye Band. Congratulations to you, Buckeyes. I wish you the best of luck against Kansas. My UK, I actually rooted for Louisville and Rick Pitino because I like Louisville and Rick Pitino. And I didn't want to have to play Florida again. Can you imagine UK having to beat Florida four times? Four times. You know, I found something out that was interesting over the weekend. It's amazing that you picked this song as the feel-good song because, you know, Ohio State's marching band is known as, my brother's an Ohio State alumni, Tabiddle. Tabiddle. Do you know why? No, I do not know why. The best damn band in the land. Well. Tabiddle. They are in the final four. And how about my UK Wildcats running Baylor out of the gym? Everybody uh, said, do they match up pretty well? You match up pretty well. Yeah, right. Didn't happen. Uh, Tiger. More sports. Tiger wins for the first time in 30 months. He closed with a 2 under 70 and won by five shots. The Arnold Palmer Invitation went Bay Hill in Orlando, Florida. Hell, he could probably walk there from his home. Tony Stewart won his second race of the season. The Auto Club 400 in Fontana, California. Uh, Spiral Stakes winner went the day well. Ridden by John Velasquez. You got to congratulate them. Great three stakes. Uh, let me see if there's anything else in sports. The Red Legs. The Red Legs lost to the Rockies 7-3. to And the big news for the Cincinnati Reds is they lost Matson, their closer, for the year due to Tommy John surgery. Oh, man. Tommy John surgery ripped. The tendon ripped from the bone. And he's got to have Tommy John surgery done for the day, done for the year. Wow. That's sad. Also, I don't know. I don't get this. The Reds are going to try out Doug Flynn 
two <laughs> in the radio booth. How many announcers? Really? I, I have to admit, I just I just don't get it. I support the Reds 100%, but I don't get why we have to have all of those announcers. And I'll tell you right now, we are so thorough in our sports report. It's only because it was on before the U.K. game. The professional bull riding, I watched this before the U.K. game. Rango and Bushwhack are two badass bulls. <laughs> the riders wear helmets. Let me see. One rider stayed on Rango for two seconds, and one rider stayed on Bushwhack for three seconds. Nobody has ridden them like than 30 rides. Wow. So why the hell would you even try to get on Rango or Bushwhack? For the thrill, it must be. I can't believe somebody didn't get killed. Yeah. I mean, I mean, that's just... It's amazing what they... It's just amazing. But anyway, uh, let me see. Quote of the days by President Ronald Reagan. Concentrated power has always been the enemy of liberty. Yeah, I'd say. Uh, in this day in history, the first free elections of the USSR, 190 million votes cast. Boris Yeltsin won the election. A 1986 Geffen record signed Guns and Roses. Really? In a big, big event in local history, 1953, Dr. Jonas Salk announced the vaccine for the prevention of polio. How about that? TC, you and I didn't have to worry about that stuff. No, we, we were lucky. We came a little bit later on, didn't we? You know, it's amazing the number of people that got polio. Yeah, yeah. Everybody got polio. Yeah. Famous birthdays. Kira Knightley, 27, the actress in uh, Pirates of the Car- Caribbean. Sexy. Steven Tyler from Aerosmith, 64. Really? Diana Ross, 68. No. The Supremes. Touch me in the morning and then just walk away. Nancy Pelosi, oh, 72. Baby. Sandra Day O'Connor, 82. Supreme Court Justice. And Spock. Spock, mm. 81. Live long and prosper. The actor. Live long and prosper. Rest in peace, old Burt Sugar, that old boxing uh, reporter. 75 passed away. And we are sorry to report a military death specialist, Dennis Weichel Jr., Rhode Island National Guard, died in Afghanistan on March 22nd, father three children. Ladies and gentlemen, the American jury, can you imagine a National Guardsman, father of three children, dying in Afghanistan? I mean, it's just sad, 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 sad. History story. Even though he gave his name to America's leading wildlife preservation charity, The National Audubon Society, John James Audubon, could hardly be called much of a wildlife campaigner. He was disappointed if he shot fewer than 100 birds a day. When he went in search of the brown pelicans of the Florida Keys in 1832, he wanted to kill 25 in order to draw a single male bird. He said of the trip, I really believe I would have shot 100 of these revered sirs had not a mistake taken place in the reloading of my gun. Later on the same trip, bored of killing birds, he took to spraying the alligators with gunshot, noting how the brains of one leapt out of its head and exploded in midair. Audubon was rarely <laughs> painted without a gun nestling in his hands, albing with a gun dog at his side. So how did this semi-literate, bloodthirsty man end up producing The Birds of America, one of the great American wildlife books? The answers, of course, his 435 pictures published in 87 sections between 1827 and 1838. It was their beauty, yes, but most originally their size. Life size that did it. Audubon insisted on printing in the punishingly expensive double elephant folio format, which is 39 by 26 inch pages. Original subscribers paid and 1000 for the Birds of America, the equivalent of 17000 now. A later miniature ed- edition was a bestseller too, but it was still drawing on the success of its mammoth predecessor. The full-size book was perhaps the finest picture book ever made. A copy and good edition was sold at Christie's in 2000 for $8,802,500. A world record for any printed book. The moral of the story is you do it right and it will pay off. Apparently so. Can you imagine that? A thousand, seventeen thousand for a book, TC. That's incredible. That is incredible. Do we have time for the joke? Yeah, we've got time for the joke. Go for it. A businessman walks into a bank in San Francisco and asks for the loan officer. He says he's going to Europe on business for two weeks and needs to borrow seven thousand. The bank officer says the bank will need some kind of security for such a loan. 
So the businessman hands over the keys to a Rolls Royce parked on the street in front of the bank. Everything checks out. The bank agrees to accept the car as collateral for the loan. An employee drives the Rolls into the bank's underground garage and parks it there. Two weeks later, the businessman returns, repays the $7,000 in interest, which comes to $19.67. The loan officer says, we were very happy to have had your business, and this transaction has worked out very nicely, but we're a little confused. While you were away, we checked it out and found out you're a multimillionaire. What confuses us is why would you borrow $7,000? The businessman replied, where else in San Francisco can I park my car for two weeks for 20 bucks?" I did not screen that joke. Smart guy. But he was a smart guy. And we come back, pop culture, and then all the serious stuff on Real Talk 1160. Remember, Michael Savage comes your way today at noon, noon to three on Real Talk 1160. And now, back to the Bulldog. This is Eric Dieter's The Bulldog on Real Talk 1160. Ladies and gentlemen of the American jury, you know I will never shy away from anything controversial, will I? Of course not. No. I will not shy away from it. And we're going to get to some controversial things. Before we do, some pop culture. A Hunger Games, third best after an opening weekend of $155 million in revenue. Cha-ching. The Hunger Games places third in all-time movie debut weekend earnings. Ladies and gentlemen, the American jury at 630 at Florence Rave Theater. In Florence, they were sold out on Saturday for every show for that night at 6.30 for Hunger Games. And uh, we were going to go see it just because we wanted to see what the fuss is all about. Now, you talk about hitting the jackpot, not only the producers of this and the author of the book, but how about the local actor, Josh Hutchinson from uh, Union, who's 19, and Jennifer Lawrence, the actress from Louisville, because, you know, they're just like the Twilight series, there's more than one book of the right. Hunger Games. Yeah, yeah. So this is going to be cha-ching, 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 cha-ching. Exactly. And they're going to make that money all at once probably because they'll have to film, you know, back to back to back before they get too old for the for the roles. You know? I mean, it's going gonna, it's gonna to be incredible what they're going to make. And happy really? for them. You know, what the heck? Really? Uh, we are glad that you're going to be multi multi billionaires. <laughs> if you'd uh, like to befriend us, <laughs> yeah, yes. Uh, the X Factor revamped. It's being revamped. There's no word on who's to replace Ball- Paula Abdul or Nicole Scherzinger as judges. There's a rumor that Britney Spears is. Uh, let me see what else in pop culture. I had some local things. Uh, movie review. I actually saw Twenty One Jump Street, and you know what? It wasn't all bad. I thought it was pretty funny. Uh, the UK Wildcats actually, UK Wildcats also saw 21 Jump Street, and apparently Calipari did not like the movie. But I'll bet you his, I'll bet you his players did. I'll bet you his players did. Uh, in science news, how about uh, Hollywood icon James Cameron going 35,756 feet deep in the Mariana Trench, the world's deepest point? The two-hour trip was completed 200 miles southwest of, west of the Pacific island of Guam. The trench is 120 times bigger than the Grand Canyon. Holy Chicago. <laughs> That's deep. Very. You know, it, boy, if this wasn't a Christian broadcasting station, some of the fun that we could have with a canyon that is 120 times deeper than the Grand Canyon. The Mariana Trump, Trench. Hey, ladies uh Gentlemen, remember the word Mariana Trench if you want to throw an insult at somebody. Uh, <laughs> let me see in local news. <laughs> nothing significant to report, so we're not going to report anything of significance. All right, let's get to some controversial issues. The Army shooting, you know, uh, Robert Bales, who shot those 19 uh, men, not went men, apparently women and children, in Afghanistan has been charged with, I think it's 19 murder counts. The United States uh, has given $50,000 per individual killed, and they were actually told the money is from Barack Obama. True. And not that this is in the United States. It is from Barack Obama. Now, ladies and gentlemen of the American jury, I don't necessarily have a problem with that, giving the money. 
I have a real, real problem that it is told to them that it is from Barack Obama. I will bet you in the entire history of the United States, there has never been some type of remuneration like this to someone on behalf of the United States taxpayer, and they were told that it was from Barack Obama or the president versus the American taxpayer. Now, ladies and gentlemen, the American jury, there recently have been numerous shootings of American soldiers by Afghan soldiers who turned against us, including at an airport where I think there was six or more American soldiers gunned down by an Afghani soldier. Ladies and gentlemen, the American jury, I have to ask, did the Afghan government give to our soldier's family the equivalent of $50,000? TC shaking his head no. And if not, one has to ask the question, why not? And why, you know the old cliche, what's good for the goose is good for the gander? Well, what's good for an Afghani individual should also be good for an American soldier. Do you not agree? Can we not agree that the American people, the American military, and the American government may have a little guilt on their minds from the blood spilled by Robert Bales? The answer, of course. He's a representative of the United States military and the American government. So I can understand that there's a little guilt. And one of the ways that you cleanse yourself from that guilt is you punish the offender and you compensate the victims. And in fact, that is part of the American legal system. Punish, compensate. Well, ladies and gentlemen, the American jury, <coughs> there is absolutely no reason why. And I, and I don't know the answer to the question. If there is a member of the Bulldog Nation that knows the answer, I would like to know it. But I would bet my house that there was no compensation from the Afghani government to the American soldiers' families that Afghan soldiers have turned against and killed. And guess what, folks? We know the Afghan government has the money because we've been given them money, hand over fist. We've been given them money to build schools, to build bridges, to build roads, to arm their military, so forth and so on. Karzai, I'll guarantee you, has got money banked somewhere in his own private bank account in Switzerland from some of the aid we've given Afghanistan. We know his brother is corrupt as hell in Afghan's largest bank that was going to go under, which I think we had to bail out. So are you troubled or are you not troubled by this? 513-579-1160. 513-579-1160. When we return... Speaking of shootings, I'm going to address the issue of the young Martin who was shot by Zimmerman in Sanford, Florida. I am going to comment upon the hoodie protest, the display of the hoodie and protest, Al Sharpton, Jesse Jackson, and others, and the president's comments, which were reported over the weekend, about how Mr. Martin could have been his son. When we return, the Bulldog will attack, as he always does. Radio Superbity on Real Talk 1160. Eric Dieters, the Bulldog on Real Talk 1160. Do you have a green water commercial, T- uh, TC? Oh, yes, we do. Give me a second here. Well, I want everybody to know that I have, I am proud, I have a show and tell okay. that I'll put up on the video cast. Uh, And the Cincinnati Business Courier, this past Friday, they have an insert called the Green Business Awards. Well. The Green Business Awards, which they put out every year, and I'm holding it up to the camera. And I want everybody to know that uh, I was proud to be at the banquet, along with TC and Sensible Don, 
uh, to receive the award for the best new green product on the market for green water. Ta-da! Wasn't that awesome? That was great. We'd like to thank the Academy for that. I mean, on Saturday night, it was a big ordeal, and green water was chosen the best new green product on the market. Because we've got the best marketing department there is, Galvanized Associates. So what do you got? Here we, well, you know, last Friday was the uh, anniversary, the two-year anniversary of the uh, Obama health care plan. That is correct. So in honor of the Obama health care plan, we have this for you here. That's right. If people didn't get sick, we wouldn't need doctors. And without doctors, the Obama health care plan goes right down the toilet. Just like where the green water ends up. So drink more green water. It'll make you sick. And if it doesn't make you sick, you can badmouth it and get punched in the face and go to the emergency room. <laughs> Slimy, great-tasting living green water. Available at Queen Kick. Happy birthday, Obama health care plan. I love it. <laughs> That was a nice tribute and a nice explanation. Hey, listen, do your part for health care. Drink green water and get sick. (laughs) (laughs) Ladies and gentlemen of the American jury, I have to comment upon the latest in the Trayvon Martin incident. We have learned since Friday that the 911 call that came in on this shooting was apparently... From Zimmerman. Zimmerman being the shooter of Trayvon Martin. He apparently, according to a witness, according to the police, there was a witness who claims that Trayvon Martin was on top of Zimmerman, beating the hell out of him. And that's prompted the 911 call. Now, at this point in time, it hasn't been public whether or not that has been verified, that that witness is credible. And why Trayvon Martin was on top of Zimmerman beating the hell out of him. You never know. Maybe he had good cause to do so. And we also know from the 911 call that Zimmerman should not have been following Trayvon Martin. Heck, the 911 operator said just leave him alone. Let me give you an example. Let me put this in context. You're home at 3 o'clock in the morning in your house. And you witness and see somebody outside your house. And you grab your gun and you go out the front door. And the individual that you want to find out what the hell he's doing runs down this driveway and up the street away from your home. Do you A, run after him, B, go back in the house, call 911 and leave it at that? I would say that 99.9% of us do B. You don't run after the guy. You go back in the house. He's, he's already ran away. But ladies and gentlemen, the American jury, thank goodness at least, Zimmerman appears from his photograph to be Hispanic. He appears to be Hispanic, not white. Now, I will say this. It sounds like to me that Zimmerman, even if he was getting the hell beat out of him, Physically, by Trayvon Martin, he shouldn't have shot him. He shouldn't have shot and killed him. He shouldn't have used his gun at all. Because guess what? An ass whooping isn't going to kill you, usually. So the response of a shooting in response to an ass whooping is unsatisfactory to me. So ladies and gentlemen of the American jury, even if the eyewitness story is true, and even if... He was, Zimmerman, getting the hell beat out of him by Trayvon Martin. I don't think Trayvon Martin should have been shot by Zimmerman. Now, here are some of the problems and issues that I do have. The public outrage from the black community in this country, from their leaders, Jesse Jackson, Al Sharpton, And all those that are, like, outraged and want vigilante justice, you know what? I don't blame them for being angry. However, however, one has to ask this question and ask them for an answer. Why aren't they outraged 
about 41 people being shot in Southside Chicago over three days. One shooting compared to three shootings. Because what they are doing, ladies and gentlemen, the American jury, and you know it, is they are using this as an excuse to create a racial issue to fire up black voters in the upcoming presidential election. Plain as day, simple as that. It's insulting. It is absolutely insulting. Is Trayvon Martin's life worth more than the six-year-old little girl in the south side of Chicago last week that was shot by a drive-by shooting because she inadvertently was in the line of fire? I say not. And the President of the United States, Barack Obama, who at all times should be representative of all the American people, and the President of the United States should be a uniter, not a divider. The President of the United States should be a healer, not a gasoline thrower. He should, in fact, be careful about his comments because the President of the United States, with the quote-unquote bully pulpit that T.R. called it, when he speaks, just like E.F. Hutton, people are going to listen. Now, Barack Obama said that Trayvon Martin, if he had a son, could have been his son. Well, guess what, Mr. President? That same analogy applies to every American male, white or black, that fathered a son, if you were white, from a black or vice versa, mixed race or not, could claim the same thing. For example, if I had a son to a black woman, Trayvon Martin could have been my son. Why would you say that, Mr. President, if you did not want to stir up the racial issue? Ladies and gentlemen, the American jury, what happened to Trayvon Martin is tragic. But what I do not get, I will not understand, and with all due respect to all those people, quote unquote, outraged over it, why there is more outrage over his killing than others who have been killed. Furthermore, the grandstanding on the stand and defend your ground laws that over 20 states in this country have passed and have the right to pass, and the attacks upon that law are incredible. Because one jack wagon Zimmerman chases after a quote-unquote suspicious character and shoots the kid when he shouldn't even have a gun, shouldn't have been following him, we call for the repeal of a good law that allows you and me to shoot a son of a gun who comes into our homes or comes onto our front porch, meaning us harm. Where is the logic with that? There is no logic with that. None whatsoever. And guess what, folks? Chuck Schumer, who I ought to jack wagon up and I will, is calling for, are you kidding me? He's calling for federal congressional hearings that these states that have enacted this law ought to take a second look at this. Maybe they did it too hastily. Chuck, guess what? It's a state's prerogative to enact a state law. The federal government has no place whatsoever in the stand-your-ground law. And he wants to grandstand with congressional hearings. It is amazing to me because guess what, folks? Either you're white, you're black, you're Hispanic, you're Republican, you're Democrat, or an independent. you got to be a jack wagon to not be on the side of Trevin Martin's family in this matter. Zimmerman shouldn't have shot him. Period. Why do we have to have one side make it into something that it isn't? 
It's the Bulldog on Real Talk 1160. Remember, if you're away from your radio, you can use the Radio Loyalty app free on your iPhone, BlackBerry, or Android and hear Real Talk 1160 24 hours a day. The home of the Bulldog, Laura Ingram, Dennis Miller, and the other guys. Real Talk 1160. And now, back to the Bulldog. Thank you, TC. This is Eric Dieters, the Bulldog on Real Talk 1160. Coming up at 12.05, not 12.05, 8.05, I am going to tell you a story about a miracle that I personally witnessed on Friday at my daughter's wedding that will blow you away. It's incredible. Incredible. And after that, at about, uh, let's say, 817, I'm going to dive into the Supreme Court and Obamacare today with some brilliant analysis that only the Bulldog can deliver for you. In the meantime, let's attack politics a little bit. Rick Santorum has lost his mind. First, he says, we might as well have Obama if you're going to vote for Mitt Romney. And then he tries to back up from that statement. Then he says he's the worst Republican in the country to put up against Obama. I mean, he is incredible. Now he's going to be at the Supreme Court today to protest Romney care. Now, let's shoot straight here, folks. Mitt Romney and his Romney care in Massachusetts was, in fact, the blueprint, in part, for Obamacare. They used it. They did some cut and pasting. So when Santorum references this, he's right. In other words, you know, how can Mitt Romney go after Obama when Romney care was, in fact, part of the equation? However, do you think Republican voters across the country want to hear Rick Santorum say Barack Obama is the same as Mitt Romney when you and I both know that that's not the case? Then over the weekend, he gets in an argument with Jeff Zellini of the New York Times, and Santorum is saying he's lying, you're lying, you're lying. Now, Santorum says... To run against, he's trying to clarify what he meant on Romney. To run against Barack Obama on the issue of health care because he fashioned the blueprint. I've been saying in every speech, quit distorting our words. If I see it in print, it's bull, the word we can't say due to FCC guidelines. Come on, man, what are you doing? You've got a presidential candidate arguing with a New York Times reporter and using the BS word. (laughs) <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen of the American jury, you know I'm a wildcat. Not just UK wildcat, that I'm a little wild and I'm a cat, okay? Let me tell you something. I would know when I'm running for president in 2020 that I can't look a reporter in a bunch of crowd in a crowd and use that's a bunch of Are you kidding me? It it makes him look unstable. And of course, Romney's campaign gets to say Rick Santorum is falling off his rocker. It makes him look very unpresidential. And, you know, it's just like Mitt Romney screws up because his senior advisor uses that etching sketch right after he wins Illinois and gets the Jeb Bush endorsement. By the way, Jeb Bush weighed in on the Trevin Martin. uh, TC reminded me at the break. And as Jeb Bush pointed out, and I can point out, everybody can point out, the stand your ground law doesn't apply to some jack wagon chasing after somebody. (laughs) Stand your ground my ass. He was chasing him. The stand-your-ground law, Chuck Schumer, isn't applicable here. But anyway, we digressed. But he wins Louisiana on Saturday. Santorum does. He wins it easily, like by 20 points. And he screws that up with these kind of comments. Meanwhile, you have the egomaniac, Newt Gingrich, refusing to get out of the race. And then, you know, he was hit. I watched the Sunday news shows, okay? Santorum was hit straight up with the question, you know, how are you going to get 75% of the rest of the votes? And he goes, well, you know, these caucuses uh, in Florida, you know, they're, it's not really winner take all or in Iowa and da 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 da. Bunch of mumbo jumbo. There's no way in hell Rick Santorum's going to be the nominee. Rick Santorum is choosing to stay in the race because it's in his best interest, he thinks, to continue to build up his name recognition. 
And then it'll help him sell books, get speaking fees, and consultant fees down the road. Because we all, I mean, look at Sarah Palin, folks. Sarah Palin was a nobody governor from Alaska, and now she's a multi-millionaire solely because she was chosen as the VP ticket. So Santorum has got, let everything, all rational thought go by the way, board. But by the way, he's thinking only of himself. Ladies and gentlemen, the American jury, that is only one way to look at it. Rick Santorum is not going to win, can't win, and he's standing in the race. I ran at the wedding, I had a few people come up to me and say, Bull talk, aren't you ready for everybody just to support Romney? And I said, Yes. I'm falling in line. It's like, come on, man. Romney, for better or worse, is going to be the nominee. It's time to get the hell out of the way. So Santorum's not doing what's best for the party. No, he's no, no. He's doing what's best for Rick Santorum. He thinks, but he's running a big risk of serious alienation. Now, see, I've got a problem with that, in theory, because he should be supporting the party. You know, what's yes. good for the party is good for me. That yes. should be his attitude, no matter yes. what your affiliation is. Yes. You know, it's kind of like, the in the sport, the use of sports analogy, it's kind of like uh, if you are a player on the team and you're hurt yeah. and you you hurt isn't as good as the guy after you that's going to play in your spot, but you insist on playing hurt even though it's going to hurt the team. Right, right. That's an analogy there for that's you. That's a good point, yeah, because you want to boost your stats. And yeah, because you, yeah. you want to boost your stats instead of, hey, man, we need a guy without a sprained ankle out there. Yeah. You know, it's like a wide rec- a second stringer without a sprained ankle sometimes is better than a first stringer with a sprained ankle. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Paul Ryan uh, on Fox News with Chris Wallace, left open the door about VP. You know, he said he wouldn't turn it down. You know, Paul Ryan would definitely deliver the Tea Party. He would deliver conservatives. Uh, Wisconsin is a critical state. Uh, might even help him maybe a little bit in Michigan. By the way, this is incredible. And I guess this may not be, in po- this may not be uh, politics, but who cares? I watched 60 Minutes last night. And there were, there were a couple incredible stories. One, about a prosecutor that withheld information. And some guy was in prison like for 25 years in Texas. And he was innocent of killing his wife. I mean, he lost everything. And he gets out. He, he Great attitude. He gets $2 million from some fund. And the prosecutor is being, they're looking at possible criminal charges. But the Jack Wagon prosecutor's lawyer is claiming, well, he's got immunity, absolute immunity. And it's a great example of why prosecutors should not have absolute immunity. I mean, why should a prosecutor have absolute immunity if they intentionally do something wrong? We're not talking about making a mistake. We're talking about where it's proven they do something wrong. But that's not the story that really struck me. I did not know about this guy until I watched 60 Minutes. His name is, I forget his last name, but it doesn't matter. His first name is Sergio, and we can all know that Sergio is good enough. The CEO of Chrysler is named Sergio. Oh. And he, he, uh, turned Sergio Fiat, Chrysler. he turned Fiat around, and Fiat is now owned by Chrysler. Okay. Chrysler paid back all of the bailout money six years early at 19% interest. Wow. So he makes no apology for the bailout. And I have to that. by the way, I'm somebody, I'm on record of this, is I supported the bailout after the bankruptcy. I wanted them to like go through bankruptcy, get rid of all the contracts and bad stuff that pulled them down, yeah. and then file, th- then get the bailout to get them back. Right. That way, it, the auto company, it's, that's what I supported. But I'm going to tell you, this cat is a sharp dude. Really? He doesn't use the big, fancy corporate offices of Chrysler building. It's vacant. He works down with the engineers where they can learn how to make cars, where he knows how to make cars. He works with the people. He talks about how great the workers are. He was the guy behind the uh, M&M commercial uh, imported from Detroit, the Clint Eastwood commercial. Really? This guy is a, and he works seven days a week, 20 hour days. Like the new Lee Iacocca. Yeah, he has five cell phones. He takes care of Europe, then the United States, then Asia. Oh, man. He doesn't wear a suit either. I like Sergio. When we come back, I'm going to tell you a miracle on Real Talk 1160. Eric Dieter's the Bulldog on Real Talk 1160. You know, ladies and gentlemen, the American jury, I love sharing my life stories with you. It's basically so I can bond with you. I enjoy uh, 
revealing them for anything else to let, just let you know that I share the same hardships, the same challenges, the same joys, the same misery, the same accomplishments from time to time that you do. And uh, over the past couple years, I have shared on the radio uh, a couple stories which many people would say, well, gosh darn, Bulldog, maybe those are those are private. Well, I don't know. You know, when you become a public figure and you're doing talk radio, um, and I was trained to do this, that the more that you share with your audience, you know, the more that they bond with you. In August of 2010, my wife lost her son to a car accident. Uh, It was a terrible, terrible experience. Uh, She's never going to be over the loss of her son. It's too permanent. It's too painful. She simply has to cope with it and live with it. Now, I will say that one of the, we come from a blended family, my wife and I, because my first wife died of cancer, which is also part of the story. When my first wife died of cancer, I was left with three children, and I wasn't on the radio at the time when that happened, but everybody knows about that story. And I was left with a nine-year-old, an eight-year-old, and a six-year-old child, and I was a single parent. Um, The other story which I shared with everybody in 2011 is that my daughter, Charlie Ann, uh, had a baby out of wedlock. And I shared that story with everybody because it was going to be common knowledge in the community. And at the same time, I just thought that it would be a lesson about life and how families have to deal with events that are unexpected. Now, the other issue uh, relative to the first wife dying uh, is very important because that was a challenge to me, which I think I succeeded as a father because the way my three children turned out. The tragedy of my stepson dying did a remarkable thing to our family. It brought us together like never before. In addition to that, my granddaughter Riley has been an incredible blessing, and my wife Mary is the primary babysitter for Riley Uh, during two full work days that my daughter works. So Charlie Ann, uh, having Riley, has just been fine. Riley has been a blessing, an absolute blessing. So when my, I got to tell you this, this is incredible. My, when my stepson died in a car accident, two of my family members My own family members did not acknowledge that to my wife, did not express anything to her, did not come to the funeral, come to the visitation, write her a card, show up at the house, do anything. Do anything. Just think about that. Two of my family members not acknowledging the death of my stepson. And I should assert that my wife nor I have done anything to these two family members. Nothing. Nothing at all. So, my daughter, Charlie Ann, who's a good kid, works hard, gets pregnant again. And the father of this child is going to be Chad Fuller, who is a nice young man. This kid is respectful. He loves Charlie Ann. He loves Riley. He has a good job. He's an incredible young man. Now, when I get this news again, I'm like, Charlie Ann, you're doing this all wrong. And Charlie Ann says, Dad, well, I want to have five kids before I'm 30. I said, that's great, but come on. So as a family, as three families, Charlie Ann and Chad, me and Chad's parents, we had to make a decision. Do we have a regular wedding? Do you not have a regular wedding? What do you do? Well, we made the collective decision to have a regular wedding. Why? I I personally thought that it was best for the kids that they have that experience. They won't feel second rate. They won't feel yucky, so forth and so on. And we were so, how should I say this, so open about the circumstances, we even put on the invitation return, yes, for the elephant in the room, because it was kind of a shocker out of nowhere, they're getting an invitation to this wedding. We said, yes, this is a shotgun wedding. We just want everybody to know that. We, we threw some humor at it. Now, I'm Catholic. 
My daughter's baptized Catholic. And this is this is the funny thing. Do you know who in our family goes to church more than any of us? Charlie Ann. Charlie Ann's a pretty regular attendee with her child at St. Pat's and Taylor Mill. Now that's an that's a very good point that I have to make. It's, that's part of my story, I'm about ready to say. We decided that we try to get married Catholic. Well, it didn't work. They had to get married quick. Too many things that you had to go through under the circumstances, get married Catholic, wasn't going to happen. Tried to get a church. Did, no church was available. We, were try, I mean, we tried to have a church wedding. Finally, we decided to hell with it. I contacted my good friend, Steve Hoffman, the Justice of the Peace, a good Democrat, by the way. And we lined up, because it was available, this past Friday at the Marquee in Wilder, a wedding at the facility with the Justice of Peace, followed by a reception. And we invited about 300 people. You have to understand, my my first wife has a big family. We invited her family. We invited my family. We invited uh, Chad's family, which is a wonderful family, and the kids' closest friends. And then... About 20 friends who, like, have known Charlie Ann since she was a little kid. I mean, I didn't even invite it. There was nobody from the radio station. I consider TC a friend, Jamie a friend, Rob. I mean, it was just the old friends that knew Charlie Ann. So we have this wedding. Now, the two family members of mine that didn't even acknowledge the death of my stepson, and by the way, these two act like they are the most devout Catholic Christians in the world. We thought about not inviting them. And we decided, well, we'll be bigger than that. We're going to invite them. Well, what happened was, is they decided to boycott the wedding because it wasn't in a church and all the circumstances and so forth and so on. These two Christian family members of mine decided to boycott the wedding and the reception. They were the only two of the invited family members that didn't come to the wedding or the reception. Now, on Friday, it was raining like hell, and it stopped raining from 3 o'clock to 5 o'clock when we took pictures over at my dad's farm, and they are incredible. You can check them out on my Facebook page. There's more to come. They're the most incredible wedding pictures I've ever seen. At 5 o'clock, when we get in the limousine to go to the service, it starts pouring down rain, and it does not stop pouring down rain for hours from 5 o'clock, the service goes off at 6.30 inside the marquee to the Justice of Peace. Short service, full wedding party, the whole bit. I walked my daughter down the aisle with Riley. And it was raining and storming as guests came in. Now, as the wedding party walked down the aisle after the service, followed by the parents, we all went outside the marquee and Wilder. Why? Because we had to get out of the way so everybody could move into the other room where the reception would start. As we got out, side, the marquee, nothing but sunshine and in the sky, not one, but two rainbows. A double rainbow. Now, I don't think there's many coincidences in life. There is no doubt in my mind that God let Charlie Ann's mother and Mary's son deliver two rainbows. It was incredible. Everybody had their mouths open. My wife was crying. Everybody was crying. And the first thing that I thought of was, hmm, my two family members that chose to boycott this as if it was something bad Take that. How many people have been married and come out from their wedding with two rainbows? It's like rain. Not many. Do you agree? No, that's a good sign. That's a now, good sign. they say rain is a sign of a fertile marriage. Yep. Oh, I it's told even, you good luck hey, on your wedding day. It's even better than that. The blessing that Steve Hoffman gave them was the Irish blessing about rain falling on your field, so forth and so on. Ah. Now, how could that be a coincidence at the moment we walked out, TC? Double rainbow. At the very least, a good omen. At best, I'd say miracle. Exactly. Now, 
I think that tells me what God thought about our little ceremony. Yeah, you got God's blessing. And not only that, the rest of the night was absolutely wonderful. Yeah. So all of you anal retentive religious people, don't be anal retentive. This is the Bulldog on Real Talk 1160. And make sure you listen for the Huckabee Report coming up at 8.30 this morning here on Real Talk 1160. And now back to the Bulldog. This is Eric Dieters, the Bulldog on Real Talk 1160. I will never, ever understand religious bigotry. I don't like snobs. I don't like self-righteous people. It's just the way the world is. Don't you agree, TC? Yes, I do. I do. By the way, one of Bulldog Nation members, Justin Sintwin, said there was a black cloud hanging over his wedding day, and it didn't leave him until he got divorced three three years later. (laughs) I feel your pain. (laughs) Felt your pain. Well, he didn't have a rainbow. Oh, that's that's what it (laughs) was. He didn't say he had a rainbow. So, in other words, he's been there, done that, got the T-shirt, and then lost it in the divorce. You know, this is my parenting 101 is this, TC. You know what? You want your children to do what you want them to do and how they want to do it and all that. But then when they don't do it the way you want to do it or they make mistakes, you might chastise them. You might say, that's not right. But then you love them anyway. Right, right. I mean, I mean, what are you supposed to do? Well, you know, you, sometimes you, just, you have to let them just let, let things let, take their course. Oh, here's a funny story about the wedding reception, okay? I, I, I was told I was going to get to say something. I was going to do a nice, short, funny toast. No, no, no. The only people that got to speak were the bride, the groom, the maid of honor, the best man, and, a, and, a, and one of the uh, wedding party. The girl in the wedding party, Taylor Landers, did a great little speech. The best man, the brother, the groom did a great speech. Charlie Ann's, <laughs> my daughter's Erica, and the groom's, I kept thinking this was like wedding crashers. My, my daughter Erica, the maid of honor, gave a speech. What I told, By the way, I told her not to say this. Her speech was complimenting Charlie Ann for choosing a guy who was a handyman. <laughs> well, that's not bad. Remember wedding crashers? We talking about green, love of money, and yeah. Owen Wilson goes, no, 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 no. Not that. And then Charlie Ann ended hers with a hell yeah. <laughs> I said, don't say hell yeah. <laughs> My, her, Redneck her, woman. Her brothers and I were saying, Jersey Shore. Uh, and then um, Chad, he sat there and just told him how they met. It, was, it wasn't it was that bad, but it was it was great. One thing you know, if you, not for you, but for any guy who's planning to get married, don't let your best man drink until after he's given the toast, because he'll spill some of your beans. That's a great point. You know? Let's dive into Obamacare, shall we? All right. 513-579-1160 if you want to comment on this. Let's go back all the way to the beginning. Congress passed and the president signed a 2,800-page law, which most members, if not all, never read. Ladies and gentlemen of the American jury, I printed it off, put it in a binder, and I tried to read it. I'm a lawyer. I'm smart. I could not understand a single page of it. That's a fact. You know, it is beyond irresponsible for our federal government to pass a law which they know would result in a constitutional challenge and leave our health care system in limbo. There are so many elements of this law which are beyond ridiculous, requiring 1099 filings for any company-to-company transaction, requiring any employer of 50 or more to provide health insurance, making it a crime not to have health insurance. Ladies and gentlemen, the American jury, we do not have debtor's prison. You don't go to jail for owing somebody money. But we're going to make it a crime? to not have health insurance, the employment of over 10,000 IRS agents to enforce this law, the countless regulatory red tape which will burden health care providers, ladies and gentlemen, the American jury, hospitals and doctors don't like this at all. But I also want to focus on the Supreme Court being irresponsible. I don't think the Supreme Court is going to issue an order for me to show cause why I should be sanctioned. They had the power to grab this case from the outset. The Supreme Court could have said as soon as the first lawsuit filed in federal courts, "Eh, we want that. Bring it up here. They didn't. Then they have been bitten with pop culture and have set three days of oral argument. And I think, is it not supposed to be videotaped? 
or audio taped. I mean, this is going to be, I think it's going to be public. I think the argument's going to be public. Now, these are smart people with a very smart staff. The crema de crema, the legal community, becomes Supreme Court law clerks. In fact, a lot of Supreme Court law clerks become Supreme Court justices. These matters have been briefed and briefed by the parties. Oral argument is completely unnecessary and a big waste of time. Nothing will change from oral argument. Ladies and gentlemen, the American jury, I have to do oral argument all the time on state and federal. Or I, and, I, and I always said to myself, why are we doing this? The judge has already read the briefs. The clerks have already read the briefs. I've never seen anything turn in oral argument. Motion dockets. I don't know any lawyer that says, boy, I changed that judge's mind at motion docket. There's also obviously the serious issue for the court besides the Commerce Clause. Clarence Thomas's wife has been involved in op- opposing this law. Now, this gives the appearance of conflict. However, it's not actually a legal conflict. It's easy for him to say, well, my wife is not me. But it looks bad. But it doesn't, I have to admit, it doesn't rise to the level of, man, that has got to be a conflict. He should not hear this. Now, Kagan, Justice Kagan, on the other hand, has got a serious problem. As White House counsel, she was directly involved in the advancement of the bill. She was shocked and expressed glee when the bill passed. How in the hell is it not a legal conflict for her to sit in judgment of it? She doesn't have the honor to recuse herself knowing what's at stake. They need every vote they can get. And for Chief Justice Roberts to defend her in doing so is a typical closing of the ranks to defend one's own. I mean, for him to say, for Chief Justice Roberts to say, oh, Ms. Kagan doesn't have a conflict. He's sure they're going to call it the way they see it. Ladies and gentlemen of the American jury, the reason why during a trial you voir dire the jury when you ask the jury questions, the court and the lawyers, is because... You want to try to weed out bias and prejudice towards one party or the other. Because, as Abraham Lincoln said, if you find the path to someone's heart, you find the roadmap to their logic. So where do you think Clarence Thomas's heart is? Where do you think Justice Kagan's heart is? You know, this is a typical, it's going to boil down to Kennedy. And you know what, ladies and gentlemen of the American jury? (laughs) Judges aren't infallible. As Robert Jackson, the former justice of the Supreme Court, says, they are not fallible because they're Supreme Court. They're fallible because they're final. (laughs) The Supreme Court, I'm going to use an extreme example here to make the point. The Supreme Court, as they proved in Dred Scott, is not infallible. Remember, in Dred Scott, they decided that a black man, a slave, was not a human being. (laughs) Thank God that that was later changed. Their handling of Obamacare has been atrocious. Atrocious. They should have grabbed it early. They should have already decided it by now. And how ridiculous is it that they say it's going to be until probably October For them to make a decision. Are you kidding me? They've already read the briefs. You mean to tell me they can't go back in their office, in their conference room, caucus, and say, okay, what do you all think? Take a vote. Who's going to write the decision? It's incredible to me. It is beyond incredible to me. Shame on Congress. Shame on the president. Shame on the Supreme Court. We come back. There's going to be more on this. It's too important. 513 579 1160, the Bulldog on Real Talk 1160. Eric Dieters, the Bulldog on Real Talk 1160. Email me at eric at ericdieters.com if you've got any contribution for the show, a witty and wise statement you want to make, or if you need a lawyer. Of course, 
for full disclosure, I am under 30 days, I guess like 28 days left in my Kentucky suspension, but I'm still ready to roll in Ohio and Florida. Uh, Also, you can text me at 859-250-2527. Not only am I the most famous lawyer in the tri-state, I think I'm the only lawyer that publicly gives out his cell phone number for you to call and text. How's that for access and consumer support? A big week this week. Friday, I move into the offices 20 feet down the hall from the radio station in this building. Uh, It will be a buzz. I will be able to walk down the hall next Monday and check on the troops, TC, to make sure they're working hard. You need some help moving? You got beer and pizza? I'll help. No. You know, one thing that I did with movers is you get a (laughs) professional. Is there anything worse than helping? A buddy goes, hey, man, can you help me move? Yeah, well. uh, Well, you know, what's even worse is when someone says, yeah, I'll help you. And then you give them like two weeks advance notice. All right, next week, and you're gonna be yeah, right. oh, yeah, yeah, no problem. You call them Saturday morning. Oh, dude. Oh man, I oh yeah, I forgot, man. I can't. You know? Can you imagine these guys? I mean, I talked to them. I got like ten bucks an hour, twelve bucks an hour. They spend all day moving heavy I know. stuff I know. every day. I know. Good golly, I bet you they big time turnover. TC, you got a major announcement about right. our live broadcast from the streetcar. That's right. Well, you know, we uh, are in negotiations with the city. We want to broadcast live from the streetcar when it gets up and running, if it gets up and running. But in the meantime, it was a good idea. Uh, Rob Williams said we should test the uh, test the, the, the Marty unit and everything downtown because all of the buildings, all that interference, right. you know, shooting the signal back. So we're going to have you Friday broadcasting live. I think we have it all worked out now. You're going to be broadcasting this Friday? live this Friday. I'm in. On a Cincinnati Metro bus. That'll be awesome. That's going to be great. Yeah. On a Metro bus. You can actually have callers. Will Sensible Don be driving the bus? I don't know if he, you know what? We're trying to work that out too because he wants a talent fee if he's going to have to drive the bus. Don, we need your help in making sure the bus is driven smoothly while we broadcast. Now he's trying to pull some strings because we want to videotape the whole thing as well. So, you know. Speaking of broadcast, major announcement. Not only are we going to be. And the opening day parade, Real Talk 1160 in my black pickup truck with lots of candy, Real Talk 1160 banner, Bulldog Nation banner, anybody that wants to participate. In fact, the gals in my law office are coming. Are they? Yeah, Loretta and Maria said they want to go, so they're going to be there. But anyway, we are going to do the broadcast show that morning from 7 to 9, TC, from Finley Market. Really? We, we are doing a remote. Nice. And by the way, last year... And the Finley Market is Grand Central Station. It's where everybody gathers. It's where the parade starts. Yeah. So it'll be fun. We'll get a lot of impromptu interviews and everything else. But uh, we will be down at Finley Market at opening day with a live broadcast. If you want to meet yours truly and TC, uh, we'll be down there having a good time. Or will you be back here? I don't know how that works. I don't know. Usually I get stuck here, but I'd be great if I could get on there, you know? It'll be fun. Why don't we get Rick the Brick to come in and do the? Uh, yeah. Now he'll be at opening day parade. He'll be hanging out. That, Rick the Brick holiday. and Lance and Jeff, you're happy to ride in the old pickup truck with me and whiskey. Now, so you understand, Rick the Brick to him, opening day is like the second greatest day next to Christmas. I would think so. Yeah. To him, it might be bigger than Christmas. <laughs> Possibly. You know, it might be bigger than Christmas. <laughs> He's back today from his vacation. Another guy's sports show this afternoon, right after uh, Dennis Miller. Absolutely. And of course, Laura Ingram in her radio addiction follows me, followed by the Savage, the Savage Nation. Speaking of Savage, this is from David Savage and my crack producer TC handed this to me, so I make sure I get it right. The Supreme Court says there is extraordinary public interest in the upcoming challenges to President Obama's health care law, but not enough for the court to lift its ban on television coverage. Instead, the justices announced Friday that they will release an audio recording about 2 p.m. on each of the three days of oral arguments beginning March 26. The court will also issue a daily transcript of the proceeding at the same time. C-SPAN, which has a broadcast public Public sessions of the House and Senate for decades said in a statement it was disappointed the court has rejected its request for TV camera coverage of the oral arguments in this landmark case. The High Court has never allowed cameras to record its proceedings. I say good for the Supreme Court. Yeah, I agree. I mean, come on, man. Let's not get the Supreme Court, you know, on the reality television pop culture track. Right. Let's not make a mockery of the Supreme Court. As we, I mean, too many Absolutely. Times, yeah, we, are in, we are in agreement there. But the cable channel said it would provide same day airing of the audio proceedings on C SPAN 3 as well as its radio channel and website. I'm going to listen to this 
um, as much as possible representing my clients, but where I'm able to, I'm going to tune in. Uh, the court did not explain its reasoning for refusing television coverage. Its public statement on the audio recordings made no mention of TV. It's advised those interested persons to go to the court's website, supremecourt.gov, each day. So there you have it. Uh, if you are wondering, and I guess this is for Bulldog Nation members who want to have a little bit more of the nuts and bolts. Uh, today, the question, 90 minutes of oral argument is going to be this. Do courts have jurisdiction, that means the power, to decide the case now, or do they have to wait until a person faced with an individual mandate pays the penalty which the court would consider a tax? If the justices decide they lack jurisdiction, the case would be delayed until April 2015 when the first payments would be due. What that is, ladies and gentlemen, is called standing. For example, in a taxpayer lawsuit, you cannot bring a case unless you're one of the taxpayers who are affected by it. And what's really messed up in Kentucky and Ohio, get this, you have to be uniquely different than everybody else. Makes no sense at all. No sense at all. Uh, Day two, tomorrow, there's going to be two hours on what's called the individual mandate. And that question is, is it constitutional for Congress to require people to buy health insurance as a form of regulating interstate commerce? This is the central issue in the case and one on which lower courts have differed. The mandate is set to take effect in 2014. Those of you that think it's a given that it's a 4-4 and Kennedy's going to decide it, the Sixth Circuit decided 2-1. to one. This is the circuit that covers Kentucky, Ohio, Michigan, and Tennessee. They decided that it was constitutional 2-1, to one, and one of the justices that voted for constitutional was appointed by Bush and is considered a very conservative justice of the Sixth Circuit. So you never know. Ladies and gentlemen, the American jury, I just can't. Forcing Americans to buy health insurance or it is criminal, in my opinion, is an insane advancement of the Commerce Clause. And those of you that say, wait a minute, Bulldog, what about car insurance? You have to have car insurance. Yes, you have to have car insurance if you choose to drive a car. Now, those people that say, well, yeah, but everybody ends up in health care, so you got to do it. Yeah, very different. Very different. Not to mention the fact it's a state issue. That car insurance is a state issue. All right, day three, uh, 90 minutes on what we call severability. If the individual mandate is ruled unconstitutional, can the rest of the law stand, or does the court have to invalidate the entire law. One possible middle ground, the court could eliminate the insurance market reforms linked directly to the mandate while letting the rest of the law stand. Ladies and gentlemen, the American jury, Congress, the Democratic Congress, in its infinite wisdom, screwed up. Usually when you pass a bill, there is a clause that says, If any part of this bill is declared unconstitutional, it is considered severed from this, and it doesn't affect blah, blah, blah. They didn't put that language in the bill. (laughs) Also on Wednesday, there's an hour on Medicaid expansion. The question, did Congress have the right to expand Medicaid, a joint federal-state program, and condition future federal funding on states' participation? States challenging the law have called it coercive. The government likens it to existing federal aid programs. Ladies and gentlemen of the American jury, I find this incredible. Three days of Supreme Court arguments, four issues to be argued, six hours of oral argument, 26 states challenging the law. Over half the states say, we don't want nothing to do with this. Over half the country in polls say, we don't want nothing to do with this. They forced it down our throat with a Democrat Congress, a Democrat president, and the Supreme Court has chose to sit on their hands while it went through the circuit courts of this country, 
rather than grab it right away. And I sit there and I look at these nine Supreme Court justices, intelligent men, the pinnacle of their profession. Heck, they sit on the United States Supreme Court. And they didn't have the common sense to grab this thing and decide it? No. The Bulldog on Real Talk 1116. I think Laura Ingram did. She'll be in at 9 o'clock this morning, 9 to noon on Real Talk 1160. And now back to the Bulldog. This is Eric Dieters, the Bulldog on Real Talk 1160. Congratulations, the Ohio State Buckeyes, the Kansas City Jayhawks, the Louisville Cardinals, and the University of Kentucky Wildcats for making it to the Final Four in New Orleans this coming weekend. Um, I hate to say this for those of you that root for an underdog. Um, the last couple years, I thought it took a lot away from the Final Four when the underdog made it to the Final Four when you knew the underdog was going to lose and not win the national championship. I mean, I mean, I thought the Butler Bulldog story was great, but it was kind of like, okay, Butler against Duke. Yeah, like we don't know who's going to win this. And um, I just think it's cool that we have four blue blood teams in there. And I think the Final Four this year could break a record for viewers. One of the reasons why is because Kentucky, with their one-and-done team, there are national, there's national interest in them as players. Also, you got Rick Pitino and Calipari, two big-time coaches. Makes a huge difference. And then you throw on top of the fact that Kansas City, Kansas City is a big-time program. One of the winning, top 10 programs, no doubt about it. You know, let's face it, top 10 programs, the four that are in the final four of all time, Indiana, UCLA, North Carolina, Duke. You know what, I might even throw in the Bearcats because of their years under Big O. But, I mean, we got blue bloods here, folks. Calipari versus Patino, are you kidding me? Kansas Jayhawks versus the uh, Ohio State Buckeyes? Sullinger versus Thomas? The storylines are incredible, aren't they, TC? Yeah, definitely. I mean, it's going to be awesome. Ladies and gentlemen, the American jury, one of the things that I have commented before about life and life being difficult is one of the ways that we are able to to get through it, is all the pauses and breaks that we have and things to look forward to. It's like there's always something to look forward to. It's the holiday. It's the birthday. It's the wedding. It's the pauses. Unfortunately, there's also pauses for funerals, but it's the pauses in life and the things we look forward to. Like, we just finished a wedding. It's my daughter Erica's birthday on Thursday. Then it's Charlie Ann's birthday the week after that. And then it's Riley's birthday. And you got spring. And, I mean, there's always something to look forward to in life, isn't there? And that's how you get by. It's like last night. I mean, it's almost every day. Like last night, Mad Men premiered. I love Mad Men. I got to watch it for two hours. Then I got to watch Shameless. And then I got to watch Spartacus. And then I got to I got like to watch five hours, House of Lies in California. I got to watch five hours of great TV in a row. I look forward to that. There's always something to look forward to. There's an event going on. The Reds opening day is coming. You got the, the, the NFL draft and the NBA draft and the NBA playoffs. It's pretty cool the way life paces us out. And that's what gets us through it, doesn't it? You're right. You're right. And and what's really neat about it, TC, I think, is it's social economic neutral. I mean, whether you are a blue collar guy living in an apartment or a trailer, or you're Mr. Rich guy, everybody gets to enjoy the NCAA. True. You get to enjoy spring. You get to enjoy baseball. You get to enjoy your kids' sports. You get to do all these things. It's incredible. The things in life that are free. Hate to be this, you know, state the obvious are the best. You got a point there. I mean, this is this is incredible. My daughter, I mean, because I'm not no multi billionaire kind of person, but you know, my father has a thousand acre horse farm that I was I grew up on, worked on, and my daughter got an unbelievable gift. We got to take wedding pictures on the farm. And you ought to see these pictures. You can go to uh, Charlie Ann Fuller, that's my daughter, on Facebook, or me, Eric Charles Dieters, on Facebook, and they've just released some of them. The photographer 
was going bonkers. She was like, by the way, I have to recommend, I think her name is Sheila Castle, an incredible photographer. She has to just, an incredible, she was like, oh my God, what have you, what have you? I mean, the clouds and then the, the backdrop of the whiteboard fence or the stalls. I mean, it was incredible. And then even at the reception, she was, oh my God, oh my God. She got to take a picture of Chad and Charlie Ann with the rainbows in the background. <laughs> Who gets that setting? So here they were getting this. Now, I t- told my dad, my dad goes, well, you know, some people we don't even know stop by the farm and do wedding pictures there. I thought that was pretty cool. They don't, they don't, you know, run them off. But how neat is that? You know, a gift, you know, those pictures. I will put Charlie Hans photos up against any billionaire's photographs from one of their weddings. I mean, I'll take Charlie Ann's photos up against Donald Trump's kids' wedding photos, who I've never seen their wedding photos, but I don't care. Her photos are going to be as neat as anything. And it, it, But by the way, she's not the only one. Your average Joe's getting married. Come up with creative ideas. One of the great things about America are these things to which I'm speaking about. It's all about our liberty, our freedom, what counts in life. You know, one thing that I love about my life is that I'm able to strive and strive and strive. I want to be a national radio uh, guy. I want to be a national television host. I want to be a um, big shot lawyer, national lawyer. I want to do all these goals. I swear to God, folks, I'm going for it. But you know what? If I fail, I swear to goodness, if I got my wife, my kids, my friends, I'm happy in an apartment with a car that runs. And a big screen TV. And a comfortable couch. (laughs) And a kitchen table. That's it. And an ice bed. And an ice bed. And direct TV. (laughs) (laughs) But you know what I'm talking about? Just the essentials. I told my wife last night, and she I said, you know, I do have disability, and she's always worried about something happening to me. I got disability insurance that would pay sixty thousand a year. And I told her, I said, listen, we could just say the hell with everything. And live on sixty thousand dollars. That's five thousand a month, TC. Yeah. You could have a nice apartment and live well on sixty thousand bucks. Oh yeah. I said so. We're taking care of if something ever happens. I mean, who gives a damn? And you know what's is funny, TC? It's almost a dichotomy and paradox. Because even though I'm striving for these things, I really can be happy. I'm a farm boy. I can be really happy working on my dad's farm and collecting my disability, like everybody else does. <laughs> uh, anyway, my what's point, wrong with that statement? <laughs> yeah, my point, my point that I'm making is, is that I really could be happy, and it's kind of comforting to me that I know that I can. Yeah. Because it it is true. I mean, it sounds stereotypical and melodramatic, but the simple things. And I thought to myself. Like Charlie Ann, the gift of those photographs, the last thing that everybody grabs when a tornado hits or a storm hits, yeah, grab, besides the life and the pets, the photographs. What's irreplaceable. Yeah. Of course, one thing good about photographs now is there's a record somewhere on a computer. That's true. You never thought about that. Right, right. The old time photographs you don't have a record of. TC, am I not a good philosopher of life? You are a very, you are a philosophizing kind of guy. <laughs> but yeah, isn't it weird the way we we do strive for material things, which is natural? Yeah. Because let's face it, those things do give you the ability to have certain things. But it's the simple things in life, the free things that are what really count. As long as you lose, as long as you don't lose sight of that, it's all right to strive. You know, I, I, I always a, joke. I'm either going to be bankrupt or filthy rich. Go ahead. Funny story. Well, not funny, just a unique story. When I, when my daughter was younger, we would always dance to Crocodile Rock, Elton John. You know, I just pick her up and just dance around. Okay, that is awesome. Well, and I was thinking about that a few months ago, and I was thinking, man, I'm glad I had that chance to do that with her. And don't you know, I won't say what radio station that song came on the radio as I was thinking of it. Okay, that little was miracle, a little audio rainbow there, little so, miracle, an audio yeah. rain. That's a good way to put it. You know, that was an audio rainbow. It was. It was. Well, ladies and gentlemen, the American jury, remember what George Harrison says: "What is life?" And the reason why I play What Is Life is for you, my fans, my friends, my family, everybody that I love, and Bulldog Nation. When you're feeling down, play this song. You'll feel better. Every dog has their day. I hope tomorrow is yours. Don't be an anal retentive religious person. Be a good Christian. Love your neighbor as thyself. Don't be mean. Mean people suck. Radio Superbity on Real Talk 1160.